Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. My name is Bob Bianchi. I'll be with you at 3 o'clock. And you know if you're on the Law and Crime Network or Dan Avon's production, you've got gavel-to-gavel coverage on multiple trials, and we've got some great trials that are in the queue. Wow, this is really interesting testimony, and I can't have a better guest than my friend Thomas Liotti here. Tom is a New York attorney and adjunct professor at Nassau Community College, a legal analyst, many publications. Uh, 400 legal decisions bear his name, over 200 trials, which is a massive amount of trials. He He's been a village judge for 28 years, and he's a past president of the New York Criminal Defense Lawyers. Welcome to the show, Tom. Oh, how are you? I'm doing nice great. Nice to see you, Bob. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. Hey, my, our pleasure, our pleasure. So, Tom, I mean, um, this testimony, very interesting. I mean, I've never heard, as, as a trial lawyer, as a prosecutor for many years, um, of a psychological personality disorder of uh, compliance with people in authority. But the reason they're trying to get this out, of course, the judge admitted it, so it's coming out in front of the jury, is because this pressure by using that read technique of questioning that the police officers on two occasions used. And you can almost see her there, frail and broken and damaged. And even the cops admit, I don't know what story to believe or not believe, which certainly isn't good for the prosecution. But I think what the defense is trying to do here, Tom, you tell me if you agree, is to say she's got a disorder that allows, makes her want to be compliant with authority figures. Yeah, I don't necessarily see the connection between the witness's testimony and an expert opinion mm -hmm. because he hasn't really defined what he means by a personality disorder here. Right. So ordinarily in these types of cases, you know from your own experience that you resort to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, which is the logbook for all psychiatrists and psychologists nationwide. Right. So you look at that and you define a diagnosis under DSM-5. And I haven't heard that as yet from this doctor, but the defense lawyer is act actually wonderful, I think, uh, because he used those words of art at the beginning of the testimony, which are, to a reasonable degree of medical or psychiatric certainty, doctor, do you have an opinion? Those are the words of art that some prosecutors and defense lawyers neglect to use. Those are very important words. So when you say a reasonable degree of medical or psychiatric certainty, you have to ask the question, what is a reasonable degree? Is it 70%? Is it 90%? And so on, because you're trying to establish a lack of proof beyond a reasonable doubt as a defense, right? right. So. How, how certain are you of that diagnosis, doctor? Right, so, I mean, it may come out on direct. It certainly is gonna maybe come out on cross-examination, so we still don't know yet. Uh, or Actually, this was a clip, but that, that may have come out during that testimony. But what I found interesting about this doctor, too, is he kind of did something that I thought was unique for an expert. He kind of took it personally, Tom. He said it was actually a shame uh, that she was put in a place where she was uh, unable to protect herself and that he felt that the police officers took advantage of her. You normally don't see an expert getting that kind of stuff well, out. These are very, very, the doctor said these are sad cases and this is a sad case. These cases are just overwhelmingly pathetic, I think. You know, you're trying to intervene as police officers and so on into the psychology of a young girl who I'm sure regrets everything about what happened here. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, they're trying to put some blame on her for the killing of her child. And this is just outrageous, I think. It really is. First of all, when you have all these men getting involved in a prosecution like this, that's problem number one. And, you know, it gets into the whole abortion debate and everything else about, you know, the morality of this, the ethics behind it, and so on. And it really becomes a big, big question for the jurors uh, because there's a big sympathy factor here, but also there's a problem with understanding the psychology that would cause this girl to do what she did. Yeah, that great, great analysis, Tom. And I would just add to it that there may be many people in that jury box that just could not see themselves doing it. And what the defense is trying to do is say, she's not you. She's suffering from things that you and I and other people don't suffer from. So either, I think they're doing this, either take it into mitigation to lower the guilty verdict if there is one, or hopefully an outright acquittal or at least a hung jury. That certainly would be a win for the defense, either one of those last two. Guys, the psychologist, Again, very important witness, so let's listen to a little bit more of that testimony. So, listen, I mean, no matter how you add this up, and we haven't seen the cross-examination yet, 
cross-examination yet, Tom. Um, this is also dovetailing with other witnesses who are testifying that known her since kindergarten, one of her friends, that she gets rolled over, that she gets taken advantage of, that she doesn't fight for herself. And he is kind of tying that in with a medical diagnosis. I get your point that DSM-5 diagnosis has not yet come out, but he's basically saying that they eventually, she said no to the thing. She said the baby was stillborn. She said that she didn't try to burn the baby, and eventually she was worn down, submitted, and complied. She complied and submit. That's how she's lived her entire life. Powerful testimony, I think, for the defense. Well, again, the police often rely on the penitent atmosphere of a custodial situation where they're interrogating a witness such as Schuyler under the circumstances. So they already have somebody who really wants to confess like a confessional in the Roman Catholic faith and so forth. They want to give it up. They want to be forgiven for their sins. And here's a woman who really, because of her psychological makeup, is even more vulnerable under the circumstances to that qu kind of questioning. So. They have, you know, a soft touch here in terms of getting a statement from her under any circumstances. And, you know, it's incredible because I see that there is a, a lack of a connection right now, at least so far that we're into this, between the voluntariness of her statements and the psychological makeup of her at the time of the res gesti or the act itself. And they're trying to connect those two things because you have to knock out the statements that she gave and at the same time present a viable defense wherein the people cannot prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt because of her psychological makeup. These are two different things. So the expert is talking about both of those simultaneously, but so far we haven't heard that connection. Yeah, and one thing I'd be concerned about as a prosecutor prosecuting this case is that you have even the police saying they can't make sense of her statement because she said so many different things. And let's not forget in the end analysis, it is the government's burden to prove beyond a reasonable doubt to 12 people People, what the story was here. This is a tough case for the prosecution. The defense is not going down without a fight. We're going to take a quick break here at the Law and Crime Network, do a little business, and I'll be back with more of these great trials and Tom right afterwards. Stay with us.